Welcome to Flow Stars, candid conversations between Dr. Peter O'Toole and the big hitters of flow cytometry. Brought to you by Beckman Coulter at Bite Size Bio. Hi, today on Flow Stars, I'm joined by Andrea Casariza and Sarah Debassi from the University of Medina and Reggio Emilia. And we hear about how they were able to respond so quickly to the news of the novel coronavirus in the early days of the pandemic. In January 2020, uh, to me, it was very clear what was going on, what could happen. And uh, I spoke with some friends and colleagues, uh, and a couple of them uh, told me that uh, we are going to see something that we, we never saw before. And how working alongside clinicians was key to getting data out as fast as possible. That moment, I mean, the important thing to do was to tell people what was happening, how it was, what was the new system was doing, and so on. And especially the most important thing that we have done is we have collaborated a lot with the clinicians. We also discussed the pros and cons of moving abroad or staying where you are to pursue a career. I am happy where I am because I, I can succeed here and I have everything to, to, to succeed. Because if you have ideas, you can also have the way to realize your ideas. And how to make some interesting food choices seem more palatable. It was the head of a goat. One half oh. of the eye was and looking at me and I said, oh, well, uh, fortunately there was some uh, uh, schnapps in front of me and so I drink three or four glasses of uh, alcohol and I was okay. All in this episode of Flow Stars. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole from the University of York and today on Flow Stars, I'm really excited because I'm joined by Sarah Debassi and Andrea Casarese. Oh, good grief, I can't get the surname spelt right. Andrea, pronounce it for me, please. Andrea is okay. Cosarita is my name. Everybody <laughs> is not really able to pronounce the name, even in Italian. So then it's not. I know, Casarese shouldn't be that difficult to say. It's just me and names. And I've only ever known you as Andrea and Sarah. So it's hard. So it's really exciting to get you both here at the same time on the same day. Because I know that you're, yeah, you have really challenging jobs. And you know, compared to some of us who have formulaic, you are on call for a lot of your time as well, because the medical side, it's not an easy gig. But you know what? I'd like to know what got you into this to start with. So, well, you both went into science degrees, if I'm correct. So, Andrea, what was your first degree? I am a medical doctor and have a PhD in uh, oncology and specialization in clinical pathology and in biochemical pathology. I have done also some immunohematology, by the way. So this is a long story. Long, I, I've been studying for a long time. Too much, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think you stop studying. You're certainly still researching, which is studying, isn't it? Oh, I'm definitely. I mean, you never stop studying. You see the books uh, behind me, so... so. It's my, my favourite job and my favourite thing to read books. I see. So, so you still prefer hardback, so, uh, real paper than the internet for reading? Yeah, this is what we, we do. All, I do all the time. This is my favourite uh, hobby, as we've said before. That, that is going to ruin one of my quickfire questions, but I'll still come to it later. OK. Sara, what about you? What got you into science? What was your first degree? My first degree is biotechnologist. I'm a biotechnologist, medical and pharmaceutical biotechnologist. I have a PhD in uh, clinical and experimental medicine, and I work uh, here in the lab of uh, Andrea Costarita since many, many years. So immunology is my first uh, uh, kick uh, in, uh, in science, I think. Yes, I, fe I felt in love with immunology during my, during my university studies, during the course of immunology, because I was really attracted by HIV virus and uh, the, 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 entry, the entry pathway on the CD40 cell. So I got uh, my first love was HIV, actually, during the uh, immunology course. So, what is, so it's, it's great you're, you're there. So from HIV, how much research? You're, you're still researching on HIV, yes, no? Yes, yes, we are. Yes, we are. We are doing still research in HIV. But how much is that diversified? Because I'm also aware that COVID had a big impact on your work lives uh, over the past few years. So how has that impacted and developed? 
Uh, well, a lot, but I think that one of the of the sentences we are always uh, used to say is "Do not panic, organize," and we did it. Uh, Professor Costarito was really was really good in organize all the lab activity during COVID situation and during COVID pandemics, and we were able to carry on different studies beyond the uh, COVID experiment and beyond COVID research. So we did also research in HIV and also uh, cancer immunology. So it was it was challenging because of course uh, most of the time we were working on COVID, but we were also carrying on other uh, project because I mean. Uh, we are doing research uh, in a very broad view, so not only COVID, not only HIV, and not only cancer immunology. And, and this is because we, we are very good in organizing uh, the lab, the activities, the people, uh, the instrument, uh, and all the spaces we, we place. Uh, I remember since the beginning of the, the COVID pandemic that uh, we place an order for the plastic. Uh, I mean, the professor can say that uh, we we we. I mean, we had, I don't know how many elevators full of plastics monos disposable for, uh, uh, for the COVID pandemic, because I mean, Professor Costa was really good in foreseeing what uh, was happening. And so thanks to this reason, we were able to, to work a lot uh, without, any, without any issue and continuously in, uh, in, in the period. So organ I think that Organize people and lab and spaces uh, is uh, the most important things in the lab, in the lab and in science in general. You have to have a clear view of what is happening, uh, who is doing what, and when uh, the people are doing uh, experiments and things. And uh, I, I'll say to Andrea, I, I think this is really important to point out. You foresaw that problem with plasticware, you brought it in, <clears throat> but it was vital because you also had some of the seminal papers around COVID and detection of COVID and cytometry and everything around it. And if you hadn't have been able to do that, you wouldn't have been able to do the research into COVID that was so important either. Well, well it's, very, it's very simple. In January 2020, uh, for, to me, it was very clear what was going on, what could happen. And uh, I spoke with some friends and colleagues, uh, and a couple of them uh, told me that uh, we are going to see something that we, we never saw before, and this was the pandemic. So I, we start to organize the lab to put uh, instruments in different areas so, so we can have a clean area, a dirty area, and whatever. And we bought a lot of stuff, a lot of uh, reagents, antibodies, material. And this was mid-January 2020, one month and a half before seeing the first patient that arrived in Italy, in Italy, we had some cases in Rome. There were two Chinese guys in the, at the end of December 2019. And then the first cases arrived in Italy around the 15th or 16th of February. So one month before, we placed all the orders and we received all the stuff, the material that we needed. And uh, we started to work immediately. And um, But before this, uh, the question was, uh, how can we manage blood from patients, because nobody ever did here on uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 virus, I mean, and uh, Italy was the first area in Europe coping with the virus. So what happened is that I had to take the responsibility to uh, decide what to do and to manage my people and to manage the blood and eventually other biological material. But uh, it was not so dramatic for me because I, I mean, I saw what was happening with uh, the SARS uh, in 2003, something like that. And I spoke with some people who had worked with SARS virus. And I knew, I mean, I, I was pretty sure that uh, we were safe and my people were safe and we could do the experiments in a safe way. So then, the, but there were a lot of questions, a lot of problems to solve. And this is why uh, Sarah was uh, extremely clever immediately in the first day at the end of February, as soon as we had the permission from the ethical committee, we start to do the analysis. And this was around March 10th, more or less. And uh, since we were absolutely ready, we took uh, maybe a couple of days to run the first samples and to see the first data that were published in cytometry in the um, middle of March 2020. And then we start to do the job for the paper that came out a few months later and for the webinar that I gave for science in at the end of April and so on. So I have to say that uh, 
Well, okay, we, we understood what was going on and we reacted immediately. Nothing more than this. So have you had time yet to take a step back? And actually, do, do you have a sense of pride that you were able to be in that position and be so successful in responding to it? Well, this is my job. I, mean, I, I, okay, I, I know I, it's your I, job, uh, uh, but I think you should be very proud of yourselves. Uh, and what you're, what the lab has delivered, and the team around you, and it's, it's, you know, I think, one day, way in the future, you may actually step back and go, yes, actually, I made a significant contribution uh, at a really important time. That actually, yeah, we all, you're always making contributions with HIV and oncology, but this was, this is one that the public is very aware of, and you're front and centre of that. Well. Um... We are happy. <laughs> what do I have to say? If my people are happy, me, I am happy. Everybody, of what we have done, we are not happy on the reason because we yeah. have, done it, of course. But uh, we are proud. I mean, we, we have done a good job. Maybe we could have done something better because I have a couple of papers that maybe could have been written differently or maybe published in another other journals. But you know. What, what, uh, what is important is uh, in this moment, in that moment, I mean, the important thing to do was to tell people what was happening, how it was, what was the new system was doing and so on. And especially the most important thing that we have done is uh, to collaborate. We have collaborated a lot with uh, clinicians uh, for the um, use of tocilizumab, which is an anti interleukin 6 receptor drug that uh, decrease the mortality in our place of about 70-75%. And this was done immediately in March 2020. That means almost one year before the uh, couple of papers uh, that uh, showed in a control randomized trials that uh, the drug was effective to block the uh, infection and to block the hyperinflammation. So we are very proud of this because we have done one year almost one year before, and more, more importantly, we have saved a lot of lives with this. That, which, is, which, is, which is why it's so tremendous. And, and so actually from the community, thank you very much for doing that. And I think your lab has been amazing and a real, yes, lots of you, you know, you were in the right place at the right time, but you were the right people in the right place and the right time. And we should never take that for granted. Uh, and we certainly don't take for granted. Uh, so you, you got into your science. Can I ask, when you were, when you were young, as a I don't know, 10 year old, 12 year old, around that age, did you see yourself as a scientist then? I'll start with Sara for that one. Of course not. No? <laughs> I wanted to be a dancer, a classic ballet dancer, <laughs> of course. Uh, since carnival party, I was wearing tutu every time. Uh, I, I, I did the cl ballet, the classical ballet, but my, my body was not for classical ballet. I was more for uh, powerful sports. Uh, so at a certain point, my parents told me, okay, Sarah, you are good in dancing, but maybe it's not your future. You cannot, you cannot eat with dance. So maybe you go and do some, uh, something else. And so I, I mean, I did play volleyball and I wanted to leave uh, playing volleyball, but then I think that uh, things were going to change, but of course not. When I was 12 years old, really, I wanted to do ballet, uh, ballet dancing. So, yes. so what got you into science then? Uh, I don't know. I think during the high school, I wanted to become a med, a med a medical doctor. Uh, and then, uh, of course, I think as most of the people that become biotechnologists, uh, I think that uh, choose to become biotechnologists because they want to be uh, beyond the, the scenes and help with the translational aspect of science, because I think it is the one of the most important and powerful things that we are doing. But yes, I think it was in the high school. At the, at the end of the high school, I wanted to do this kind of, uh, of job. And I had a quite clear idea of what I would like to become. Uh, I didn't know if uh, I would have stayed in Italy or uh, go or going abroad. Uh, that I didn't know. Uh, but then I found Modena and I find my second place. And I think that never in my life I will go in a place in a, in a place different like this because I here I really found the environment I really like when where I can have 
a real balance, mental balance, first of all, and the balance between my private life and my life, and where we can be really, I don't know how to say, but really competitive with all the rest of the world. So <clears throat> I found my America here in, uh, here in Malta, I think. I find my NIH, I find my, uh, my everything here. Okay. You have to say that with Andrea listening, of course. Oh, I, I'm... No, but I think, I think he knows that because every, no, no, I think he knows that because many times I told him this, uh, uh, this story. I mean, when I was, uh, I think, 21 years old during my first year of uh, university, I wanted to go abroad because most of the people I knew went abroad, uh, America or UK or Germany or uh, uh, Asia, Africa, or I don't know, ev everywhere. And there was a suffering because of that because I saw that a lot of people went out to Italy and I was really convinced not to go out because I, I, I really thought that here I could have my way and uh, and I, I felt really competitive and really really uh, international here because of uh, collaboration because of the uh, story of the lab so I really found what uh, what I, I'm, I'm really happy of this I can say to all the PhD students find your way because it is the most uh, important things in your life and well, and and you have succeeded so you didn't have to go abroad no 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 no, no. that's that's why i mean i i i i am i am happy where i am because i i can succeed here and i have everything to to, to succeed because if you have ideas you can also have the way to realize your ideas and you don't Andrea, need to... I, I cannot throw her away. I mean, it's impossible. I would like to send Sarah somewhere for many years, but uh, <laughs> people don't want to move. I don't know why. Maybe they have too much fun here. <laughs> yes. And the food is good and the life is good. I mean, balance is the most important thing. So I know that, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, a, healthy, a healthy environment is what you can, uh, it helps you thinking well, I think. Uh, interesting, Andrea, I think you came to the UK and went to the US before returning to Italy, is that correct? Yeah, even to France. I've been um, in different places, so, but only for short periods because I, I graduated in Padua, Padua University, which is one of, actually even now it is probably the best uh, medical school we have in the country. And um, I followed my professor when he came to Modena in the middle of the 80s, almost 40 years ago. But I decided to do immunology much time before in the, in the end of the 70s, because I was studying immunology, it was very fascinating for me. And uh, I had the opportunity to go to the Basel Institute for Immunology in February 1979 and to spend a couple of weeks as a medical student. Uh, actually, it was not really as a medical student. I was there because uh, I had friends, uh, so they, they took me around. And uh, I saw the, the Basel Institute, uh, and I said, OK, I like this. I want to do this. Finish. That's all. Mm. And then it happened to me to go to New York a couple of years later, because, I, again, I have friends there, and friends of friends sent me to the NYU, and uh, I met uh, nice people, and so I decided to do immunology. And that's all. It's my, my, my occupation. And so, so you sample science in France, UK, US? Yeah. Where's the best place? Italy, France, UK, US? Of course, Italy. <laughs> It is the right answer. Uh, yeah, I mean, Italy because I'm here, but um, well, I was in New York, Los Angeles, London, and Paris as a city. I mean, so and there are different cities. I cannot say I love one more than another because I mean, for, but I have a very, very good friend in Los Angeles. So I love to go there. I, I'm not going there since a few years, but uh, I love LA. And the point is, how can you love LA? Because I have friends there. So I, I, they live in um, Westwood, which is close to UCLA. So we, go to, we went to work uh, by walking and crossing the, the center of the city in the middle of uh, LA, and that's it. Then in New York, when I was there, I was living in the village. In the village, and I was working at NYU, so it means uh, for maybe 30, 40 minutes walking through the city. In London, I was living in Holland Park, which is great place and I was working in the 
Royal Free Hospital, which is quite close. And uh, in Paris, I was living in the center of the city in uh, uh, Saint Michel, which is another nice place. So um, uh, I mean, I, I think that I have been very lucky in my life because I could, uh, for some reasons, I mean, I, I could join the fact that to live in a big city, in a, to work in big places, big labs, uh, and with friends, uh, and uh, enjoy life. When you walk, uh, when you are 20, 22, or something like that, uh, walking to walk in New York, uh, in Manhattan, is an experience. The same if you are in Paris or in, in LA, it's something very exciting. I mean, you have the, 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 the capital of the world around you at that age. <clears throat> Which, and it's not just for work. I'm sorry, you, you've obviously stayed in Italy. I, I've stayed in the UK. But obviously we have conferences and we can go around and travel with the conferences. So I've got to ask, what is your favourite conference? Uh, I'll ask Andrea first this time. Well, of course, I decided to. Also, of course, we, we could not attend this year because of some technical problems and things to do in, that were quite complicated. But uh, I've been to many of I, I have to say that I like conferences where you have a limited number of people, let's say less than 150 or something like that. So you can really interact with people. And so and there are many national societies that have uh, meetings, uh, especially in immunology or in uh, cancer. And to go there is something very, um, very useful because you come back uh, with ideas, with talk, with friends, with uh, discussions uh, and so on. Going to a big meeting is nice, it's fine, absolutely. But you have to know what you have to do. I mean, you cannot go there because I go to the meeting. I mean, you need a plan, you need uh, a schedule, you need a timetable and so on, which is quite different from for uh, small meetings. I mean, if you go to, I've been many times to HIV meetings in past years, I'm talking about uh, 15 to 20,000 people is something big. FASEB meeting is the same. So in those meetings, you, you can lose yourself. So I, I really suggest uh, young people to go to meetings that are not that big and to meet people and to talk with people. But uh, there are other meetings like Saito that have a good dimension. You have maybe six, seven, 1,000 people, 700 people, 1,000 people, which is a Big, but not so big, not that big. So, uh, so what about you? What's uh, yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with Professor Costritz. I mean, when uh, I be on Saito, which uh, really uh, I love it, and uh, where I can find uh, always friends and share the, the, the last technology, I mean, it's a very familiar. It's a very familiar environment. I really love uh, to go to immunology meetings, such as the European Congress of Immunology, for example, uh, because I think that uh, this is not, I mean, it is a, a very good Congress, not big, but not so big, where you can find and you can operate, uh, I mean, we could, where you can interact with people, uh, European people, but also people coming from uh, from US. And uh, usually it is very well organized, really, really well. And you can find all this immunology aspect you, you really like to, to know and a lot of key, keynote lectures uh, done by really very good speakers and uh, really nice overview just to review your knowledge and update your knowledge on immunology. So I really love uh, the European Congress of Immunology. Yeah, beyond side, of course. <clears throat> so we've talked about traveling with work, not traveling with work, we talked about conferences. If you could work anywhere in the world, where would you choose? Or if you retired, where would you go and live anywhere in the world? Uh... I'll start with Sarah on this one. Seaside, for sure. Uh, I don't know, a place where you can have, uh, I mean, uh, you, where you can stay well, where you can have a good weather, uh, not storms or not uh, so, so cold. I don't know where. I don't have a favorite place in the world because I travel a lot, but I don't have a favorite place. Uh, but I think that uh, sometimes when I'm tired of working, I'm just repeating myself, okay, 
I cut off and I'm go to Mexico. I think that Mexico is my favorite place. Even if I, I, I even not, I didn't, I, I, I've never been there, but Mexico is for me something really nice to go. And uh, when I'm, when I'm done, okay, I'm going to Mexico and I'm going to break coconuts on the, on the, on the beach. I don't know why I'm continue to say myself <laughs> these things, but I really love this. So that's, so that's interesting. Cause Saito, so I don't think Saito has ever been to Mexico, has it? No, I don't think so. I don't and think we so. go to Canada's next year. Oh, maybe. <laughs> and, no. You know, so maybe we should just flip through after Europe, come back down and flip through yeah. us and down into Mexico. Yeah, Mexico is. I, I like it. I think they are very relaxed. They have siesta. They they can they can really be single task. When you are single task, you are very relaxed. You 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 are not allowed to do many things uh, in in the in the same time. So you are very relaxed, and I think that Mexico could could be okay for me. So I'm looking at both of you. We've got an Isaac Council member. We've got an Isaac past president. Come on, pincer movements on on the on, <laughs> on the new president. Go, go and have a world with Rachel. Say, <laughs> oh, we need to go to Mexico. It's not. We can propose. <laughs> It's not so easy, I mean. Yeah, no, I know. And what about you, Andre? If you could go anywhere, where would it be? Here. I am my place in Modena. I have no reason to, to go around to, to move. I mean, we have plans uh, to go uh, to Sicily after retirement and maybe to spend uh, six months here somewhere and six months here in, in Modena. But the place is great. But the, the weather is sometimes humid and hot, but uh, air condition works. So it's uh, then the, the, the system, we have a lot of friends, uh, even too many. And uh, so I don't see reasons to, to, to go around, to, to live in Modena. I mean, maybe to spend uh, some months around the world would be nice going to Mexico or going to South Africa, which I love, or to Australia, which is fantastic and not very close, but uh, Many parts of the world deserve a visit or deserve a period to stay. And but my life is here. I love the passion, and and it's good to hear, isn't it? It's nice to know that you're in the place that's right. Yeah, sure. You know, Modena is a we have a good uh, a good uh, balance between uh, the fact of being a city but not a big city. Uh, it, it means that I can go by car from my office to my house in eight minutes, maybe nine, if all the traffic lights are red. And uh, which is, if, if I can walk, there are four kilometers, I could walk, so it would be not a problem. Um, so this is my major, 200,000 people is okay. Ah, so it's a very similar size to York. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's that's very similar. you can go to Bologna, which is uh, half an hour, even less by train. Uh, you go to Milano, it's one hour and a half by train. Rome is three hours. Uh, Florence is one hour and a half. So it, we are in a very strategic position in the north. So we can go almost everywhere and come back in the same day without any stress. <clears throat> and that's okay. In terms to, to so, live. The next part. So we talked about the research. But obviously, you're also both really well known for your flow cytometry. So how did you get into flow cytometry and what was your first flow cytometer? And I'll start with Andrea on that, because this is bound to be quite an old flow cytometer. Uh, when I was in New York uh, as a medical student in 80, 1981, uh, for more than 40 years ago, and they had a very strange machine. I mean, very strange at uh, that time was something strange usual stuff with some bottles here and there and um, something flowing in the on the screens uh, small screens sometimes they the machines at that time were very similar to a um a russian space ship you know something <coughs> like that and um, i mean i I, I was absolutely not understanding what was going on clearly i was just a medical student but it was nice and then i was i approached flow cytometry in when i was after my graduation in medicine in the hematology school uh, because a friend of mine who was my my companion my mate i mean my my friend in the same group uh, uh, he was working in venice and uh, he had a fat star flow cytometer it was yep. in 84 85 something like that 
and uh, I was uh, working with it. I mean, I was still, I was in Modena already, but I went to Venice every second week or so to do experiments with him and to do uh, to perform uh, the very simple uh, staining of peripheral blood cells for HIV because at that time flow cytometry meant HIV. This was the, the, the I mean, the, the program for HIV fight in Italy was the reason why a number of cities, a number of hospitals were buying flow cytometers for counting before cells. And this is what how I started. And then uh, we bought uh, here a second hand uh, fast scan, maybe 89, something like that, and then other machines. And then I was able to, when I had my grants and my, my money, I could start buying other instruments. And so I started working with the Partec, with uh, thanks to a very good collaboration of friendships with uh, both and Goethe and the Goethe family. And we had uh, one of uh, 12 color flow cytometers in 2003, something like that. And we did nine colors. Man. I mean, it was the problem is not to do colors. The problem is what you have to do with something, you know, which is the science for which you need technology, not the reverse. So, and uh, we have done some time. Then, little by little, we, we have built uh, quite a good uh, facility. It's not a facility, a, a good amount of uh, instruments, reagents, uh, and people, of course. So uh, how many cytometers do you now have? Well, we have some. We, I don't think, I don't think I can, I'm allowed to speak about that because uh, we have some. We have three, four, five different cytometers now. Sarah? Four. 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 Oh, five. Four. 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 Five. Five, yeah. If we not bad for one group. As you say, you're not a facility. Five. Five. No, no, no. It's not a facility. Oh, yeah, no, so, so that, that's kind of, that, that's a big thing. That's a lot for a group. Yes. Yeah. You know, for a facility, that's a, that's a good number. For a group, that's a big number. Oh, we can have more now. We have plans to get some more. <clears throat> no, I mean, there is a, after. Honestly, I have collaborations with a number of companies. So we, we work with them, we set up new methods, new technologies. Uh, uh, we try to improve also the, the existing technology. And so this is why we have some machines and people are happy to work with me and, and with Sarah, and especially with Sarah, more than me. And uh, they, so this is why we, we, we build, we, we have a number of instruments here. Uh, sorry, it sounds like you're the, the person that's all the, the fingers, yes. the hands on side of this. So uh, what's your first yeah. cytometer? And what, what got you into flow cytometry? Was it being there to start with and it was there and naturally it went that way? I was here in the lab and in, in this lab there were cytometers. So I started to use cytometers. Uh, at the beginning, I didn't know really what to do with cytometers because they were like uh, machines. Uh, but the, 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 the good things is, is that uh, I started with the Partec with a prototype uh, that was, I mean, made here. So I had the, the, the chance and I think I, I developed the knowledge during that period on really how these instruments are built and how to put ends in this instrument when the instrument <laughs> did, did, did not work. So I think that this, is, this was kind of an opportunity, uh, very challenging at that time. But in these days, I really, I, I was luck to be in, uh, in, in the lab in, the, in that period, because uh, thanks to that period, now I have a kind of a knowledge that I think that uh, young people uh, uh, now, I mean, they yeah. have, but they have to study. I, I put the hands in that machine. And I remember I, I really enjoyed that moment because it was changing the filters, changing the path, uh, opening the machine or oh, oh, the lasers are oh, okay. Open and close the lasers. I was really, it was very nice to me that uh, that period. I, I was feeling like an air really. I, <laughs> I had- Which is very different from now because- Yeah, when... now it always is automatic. You also sorters are automatic. Oh, yeah. I, I, we didn't have an automatic sorter at that period. And we were measuring the delay and everything by, by hands and by beats and by counting. And it was kind of a crazy nightmare, but uh, it, I think 10 years pass and the, the technology is completely different by now. But I was lucky uh, being that period in the, in the lab, I think. Sarah, you can say also 20 years. 
No, 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 20 years, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> 20, but 15, not 15. That's more than 10, yes. <laughs> no, 15, come on. <laughs> this is like throwing. throwing I remember when we, we had the first one here in, in Modena in 88, 89, something like that, and the compensation was not there. I mean, you had to compensate some, somehow in the, in the box uh, with the hands, uh, pushing buttons, doing things like that on the machine, not on the computer. And this was something unforgettable. When we were able to do three colors, it was fantastic. And the first paper in, in blood uh, in 1990s and 91 maybe, with three colors was something really <clears throat> exciting for us. And then, uh, and that period, that period I, I was in London before this, because in London, in the group of Mark Feldman in the Charing Cross Sunday Research Institute, they had a dual laser fat star that nobody ever used. I mean, they just was they were working with one laser, two colors. So the uh, second laser was, was for the third color, and uh, probably I was the, the first guy using that laser for APC, if I remember well, something like that. And the paper came out in the European Gemology in '89, so. Uh, I can, I, I have the proofs of what I say, <laughs> because I, I mean, we, we have done that. The, well, I, I noticed you both said that you've been lucky. Yes, yeah, sure. But I think to an element, you created your luck by seeing the opportunity. And then so you, you grabbed it and, and, and made your own luck by being the right place, right time, but seizing that moment. So. I'm going to ask a slightly different question. When has been the best time of your careers? Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I like the answer. And a very quick up. Sarah, what's been your best time to date in your career? <laughs> well, uh, I think that every day I'm happy was my best time in my career. I mean, every time I, I got a success and every time also I got an, a not success because uh, I think that you, you, learn, uh, uh, you learn more uh, doing a crappy thing in the lab than, uh, do it, than gaining your success. I mean, so as... When I, ha when I am happy and when I am fine and when I am, I mean, okay with myself and my work and my everything, every day is a success. So I don't, I don't remember a really good success. I mean, I like when I won the, the best poster session in Saito in two different years. I remember when I graduated, I remember everything. But this is kind of ordinary when you are enjoying your life and your work. So I think that every day is a good day. Uh, uh, and I remember, I mean, I can remember yesterday, I can remember today and the day before yesterday as good day. So it is a success in my opinion. I, I don't think I've met a group that is so happy and, and positive about <laughs> you have life. to come to modern really. <laughs> so, but i pay her well so this is <laughs> but it's not about <laughs> i love sarah if you're listening to this not watching sarah shaking her finger no 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 <laughs> no 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 really no 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 i, I really i really like uh, i mean every day could be a success because at the end of the day if you sum up when you are before going home, what you have done, uh, not a day is lost. So every day counts for your career, every day counts for your job, every day counts for your uh, objective in their life. So no, I, I think Andrea's answer of tomorrow is, is sums it up. No, I, I, actually, yes, it is. But the best, uh, I can say what I have, which is the best thing that I have done, maybe. In the last year, it was not uh, to do philosophy, it was not to do science, it was to help uh, in organizing the vaccination campaign in the country, in all the country. And uh, this is what I have done, and this is what I put on my heart like a metal. I mean, because uh, apart from the organization of the lab, apart from what we have done here in Modena for research, uh, for science, and so on. I was lucky again to be involved in the national campaign at the highest level, highest level. And uh, I spent a lot of time, a lot of, of, of efforts. And I, actually, this was also some, something that uh, uh, was interfering a lot uh, with my activity in, the, in Isaac uh, because I had really 
very little time to do everything in the in the last uh, years because of this reason. So and uh, actually, I'm very proud that in Italy we have a very very high percentage of people who receive the vaccine. And uh, by the way, also Modena is the uh, probably one of the highest cities. I mean, with a percentage of, of people. Yeah. people. And um, we have been, me and other people, I've been very involved in talking, just talking with everybody, doing uh, in meetings, uh, speaking with the TV and with the journals, newspaper, magazines, and so on. So it was, uh, this is uh, the best thing that we have done, that I have done to organize, to help in organizing the campaign everywhere. And this was something much more important than what we have done in, in, in terms of papers and whatever. Which is an amazing achievement, but it also must have meant a very different way of working and different challenges coming to you. And how did you find that change? You must have been talking and communicating with people that are not, not necessarily scientists and having to communicate the and importance. That's a good question. This was very difficult because, I mean, uh, the, my trick was simple. Don't talk about things that you don't know. That's all. Just talk about, speak about immunology, explain immunology, explain the vaccine. Don't mess up with uh, predictions or um, with uh, what I think of the future. No, because I, this, is the, this is the first pandemic that we have, actually, in the last uh, 100 years or so. And um, nobody has the receipt uh, to go out to, to solve the problems or to do. So we have to work, uh, I don't say day by day, but uh, to be in, in a <laughs> mondial experiment in which everybody has to do something, but there are no written rules to do things. So you have to speak and to explain people what is going on. You have to explain people that we are using the vaccine that you can have problems because there are side effects like all drugs. You have to explain people that you need to do the booster or the third dose or the fourth because of this, 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 and that reason. And your credibility is high when you do not say stupid things or you do not uh, uh, enter into discussions. Uh, in, I never, I've never been to a talk show, never. Those shows are disgusting because uh, I mean journalists or whatever they want to have audience. They want to put people one against uh, the other. And so, if I say that uh, um, this uh, is uh, I don't know one kilometer or uh, one mile, and if you say that it is one point six kilometers, okay, this is uh, a way to discuss, even if we are saying the, the same thing. Because they want to put one against the other for the audience. So after the first the first months of panic, total panic, then one of the big problems that we had in the with the press, uh, with the media, was the communication and how media were speaking with people. And then when vaccine er, vaccines arrived, it was clear that it would have been a mess because the number of different vaccines, a number of different companies, and so on. So the, the point is that when we started to, to work in this field, I mean, to communicate, you know, I'm an immunologist, I'm working with HIV with other viruses, so I was the right person to ask things. Me and others, not only me, of course. But um, the, 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 the problem that we, we had was to communicate correctly to people and to convince people to do things that had to be done. This was my, my main uh, achievement. I think there's a lot of responsibility with that. And the responsibility is probably greater than you realized at the time, because if something had gone wrong, the credibility of science would have also taken a, a, a bashing. And you know, the public's faith and you know, our governments put a lot of funding into scientific research. It's what funds you, it what funds me, and it's that faith that we will do the right thing with that science and be honest with that science that is first and foremost. And if something had gone wrong, and you're rightly saying, if you'd have spoken out of turn, something else or predicted, and it proved not right, the, the faith in the top scientists would have been lost, I fear. 
but it never happened. And I, I, I think that's amazing, actually, because I, I, I don't know, but I, I'm guessing you didn't have a lot of press training of how to communicate. It's just something you naturally do as a scientist. Uh, actually, I have a good teacher. I have a good teacher. And my teacher is Paul Robinson. I mean, Paul Robinson, because uh, uh, since more, I, I, I knew him for uh, ages. But uh, what uh, I learned from him is that you have to communicate things in a very simple way, in a way that people understand. And if people do not understand, it is you that we, who are wrong, not them. So, and uh, there is a wonderful lecture that Paul gives, uh, gave for many years, and maybe even now, and it is how to present your data. And it is uh, something incredible, intelligent, uh, because in, in this presentation, it's a very simple stuff. In, you have, uh, Paul, I mean, shows you what you have to, how you have to prepare the slides. How is a slide prepared and how is a presentation prepared? Avoid this, avoid that, do this, do that. If you understand the logic which is behind a simple PowerPoint presentation, the logic is very strict, it's very strong. I mean, be clear, speak clearly, don't say things you don't know. This is what is the message. And if you apply this to your life, I mean, to the to speaking in public, uh, to, to present data or to discuss a grant, uh, be open and tell the truth. That's all. It's very simple. Now, I'm going to come to some quick, some quick fire questions because I, I just see how you go with them. Are you an? Uh, I, uh, who am I going to start? I'll, I'll go one by one. Uh, so Sarah first. Early bird or night owl? What? Early bird or night owl? Early bird. Early bird. Andrea. Night hawk. Night, <laughs> night, night. All my life. That's okay. Andrea, PC or Mac? Mac. Sarah? Mac. Two Macs. Sarah, McDonald's or Burger King? McDonald's. Ooh. Andrea? Fancy restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> Which comes to, if you were to be taken out at a conference or at, as a keynote speaker, what would be the best food that they could put in front of you? I'll go, Sarah, first. Please don't say Big Mac. No, lasagna, okay. but, but it is impossible because uh, my mother should have cooked it. So <laughs> every, around the world is <laughs> not possible, but lasagna is my favorite food, yes. <laughs> Andrea? Uh, well, difficult to answer because, you know, in Italy we have tons of excellent restaurants, including the top restaurant in the world, which is here in Modena. But uh, something that I eat uh, all the time, so it could be... August 15th or uh, Christmas are tortellini. Uh, tortellini, which is a typical uh, this year. Yeah. Okay. What the, the, the opposite to that? You sit down and what is the worst thing that they could put in front of you? You just go, oh, I wish they knew I didn't like that. I'll start with Andrea on that one. It depends where you are. I mean, since uh, it happens to, for me, to me and to Sarah, to all, all of us, to be guest on someone. Uh, you cannot say, I don't like, I don't want, it's impossible. But I can tell you which is the most difficult thing that I had. It was the head of a goat. One half oh. I had, uh, with in, in Norway many, many years ago. It was a typical dish for Christmas. And uh, I had this poor animal like that on, my, on, my, on the table. And... Uh, <laughs> The eye was looking at me and I said, oh, well, uh, fortunately, there was some uh, uh, schnapps in front of me. And so I drink three or four uh, <laughs> glasses of uh, alcohol and I was OK. But another thing is when I went to e Asia, Asia in uh, China or in, in Thailand or in Japan or so on. And when I eat something, I don't know what it, that I don't know, but oh, it's OK. I would like to know what I am eating, even if sometimes it is like, impossible. <laughs> Just to the... go there. The same for them. I, I mean, the same for Asian people who come here to Italy. Of course, they eat things that they don't know. It's, uh, it's cultural, but uh, I never have problem with, with food. Yeah, but Italian food is the best food in the world. Sarah, what about you? 
Uh, thanks to a friend of mine, uh, I learned how to taste everything. So I really, I can say that I don't like duck, for example, but uh, thanks to a friend of mine uh, who I met in flow cytometry environment, by the way, uh, I learned how to taste everything and, because it's a cultural experience, but I don't like duck. It's a lot. It's just like me, we, we had duck uh, in, uh, in Shanghai, maybe. Yes, I taste that. Yeah, I don't like it. Very good. <laughs> Food there. Okay. Uh, uh, Sarah, tea or coffee? Both, but I prefer coffee. There you go. Andrea? I saw coffee short. Espresso. Yeah. Could yeah. be. Definitely. I'm here. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Uh, Andrea, wine or beer? Wine. All my Better life. white. Uh, it depends. You cannot say. Uh, okay. The only thing it, it is that it, ha it has to be wine. I mean, strong wine, not not be not below thirteen degrees of alcohol. After uh, below thirteen, it is um, not really wine. Uh, I'm man after my own heart. Usually, it's fourteen plus percent. Yes, but I'm a yeah. Zinfandel person. Oh, oh uh, yeah. No, I mean, I mean the, the problem is like wine has to be to mature. So if if, if wine matures, uh, the alcohol, the, the degree of alcohol goes up. So this is very simple. You can have light wines, uh, no, why not? But uh, it is not like a Barolo or Brunello or Amarone or a Shiraz or whatever. So these are my favorite ones. Maybe red more than white. When you come to York, I'll have just the right bottle. Sarah, what about you? Uh, Wine or beer? Prosecco wine. And red or white? It's white. It's white. Okay. And so with that, so chocolate or cheese, Sarah? Mm, chocolate. Milk or dark? Milk. Oh, tacky stuff. <laughs> it has its place. Andrea, <laughs> what about you? Ch chocolate or cheese? Again, it's difficult to say. It depends what you are, you have in front of you. It depends, but in, in principle, cheese, parmesan with balsamic vinegar on the top, which is something we, we also we, we produce in my house. We have balsamic vinegar downstairs. We have a uh, barrels and uh, dark chocolate. So, uh, yeah, definitely dark chocolate. That I, I'm going to come to Sarah first, so I think I know what the answer is going to be from Andrea from earlier. Book or TV? I don't have time for uh, neither of them, actually, because I became a mother last year and a half. So my time is fully occupied by work and being a mom. But uh, usually I prefer book than TV. If, okay. I, if I'm watching television, it's because there is some kind of uh, good films uh, on demand or a serious uh, television, but not uh, ordinary TV. I mean, I don't like it. Your TV habits will change as they get older. <laughs> Good. Uh, but you can zone out and just enjoy being with them at that moment. How have you balanced work with having a child? Ah, I can balance it. I, it's, the, the problem is that when, not the problem, the issue is that when you are at work, you are 100% at work. And when you are at home, you are 100% at home with your daughter when uh, she is uh, uh, awake. And when she is going to bed, you can go to work again. Okay. Or you can go to bed. It depends. <laughs> sometimes it's better to go to bed, but sometimes uh, it, I need to work again. So uh, you have to be 100% where you are physically. Otherwise, you are not successful in, uh, in anything. If you are at work and you're thinking about your private life, uh, you are just going, got anxious or something different and uh, vice versa. If you are with your daughter and you are thinking about your job or about your problem on job, you are not enjoying your real life. So I think that once you are in the place, you have to be physically and mentally in the same place. Okay, and Andrea, I, I'm gonna start with a book or TV. No way. Uh, okay, I read a lot of papers, uh, scientific stuff, uh, but uh, I always watch TV in, in the sport channel, in NBA channel. So I'm very fan of basketball. I was playing basketball when I was young, and uh, so I love this. Sometimes, also, I mean, the second sport is rugby. Rugby, the old yeah. black are my heroes, actually. 
and uh, I don't like the football too much. I mean, I, being an Italian, you see, you watch the TV when you, they play football, but I don't not like that much. I hate such a soccer players. I mean, they, they are false. I love rugby when rugby, if you are, if you are not dead, you play. This is what I like. <laughs> and also tennis, so a lot of sports. I hate talk shows. I hate programs where nothing happens. I hate uh, uh, programs where you they pose you an, a stupid question, you answer in, in, in a even more stupid way, and you get money. So this is something I quiz or stuff like that. There's no money with these questions, don't worry. Ah, that's a pity. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not, we, we, we were, we're agreeing on this, okay. <laughs> what about your favourite films? Mine? Yeah, go on, Sarah. Top Gun. No, come on. Bye. Yeah, 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 I like Top Gun, yes. I like Top Gun, yes. It was one of my favourites when I was uh, very young and still is my one of my favourites. Then there are a lot of other films that I like, but I mean, I don't remember. The one I remember is Top Gun, and there are kind of scenes that I really love about Maverick and, uh, I mean, good. And Top Gun 2? No, the one. I, I, I haven't seen this, the second one. You haven't seen the second one? No. I recommend it. Never see the second one you like the first. No, I recommend it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, 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 I took, uh, we took our son to watch it, and actually it was surprisingly good. Okay, good. Yeah, so Thank it was a good couple of hours to zone out. And actually, it's been so long since I've been to the cinema that they've done it all out. The seats were really comfy. And I've got to say, I didn't fall asleep. And that's really good. That's a good credit to it. Because usually when there's a film, I zone out. And that's the only time I stop thinking. Okay. And I usually then shut off and just, <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I love Andrea's respect. <laughs> the, the comment when you said Top goes like, no, no, no. You might not have a job tomorrow after admitting that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's okay. No. Well, in what's your favorite film? My favorite, if I have to mention one film only, uh, Frankenstein Jr. by Mel Brooks. Isn't so it? you had a go at Sarah for watching Top Gun, and you got for Frankenstein Jr. Yes. I can, I can, I know by heart all the, all the, all the single moments. This is a fantastic movie. Or all the movies by Quentin Tarantino. I love Tarantino. I mean, it's, uh, Pulp, and Pulp Fiction is a uh, pure genius. Pulp Fiction is, and Kill Bill, both films. The soundtracks yeah. make them, don't they? Yeah, sure. The soundtracks uh, are so much part of those movies. that Because, they, I mean, it's really something unbelievable. When I saw Pulp Fiction for the first time, I was laughing for it. Yeah. I mean, even if uh, some scenes were a little bit uh, tough, uh, pulp, of course. Yeah. Now, I've watched it with uh, one of my sons. Uh, he's old enough now. <laughs> he's just, just watched it. <laughs> Loved the film. But yeah, some of them are a bit awkward uh, in moments. <clears throat> so we, we're nearly up to time. And I can't believe that that is actually nearly an hour. And I've got so many questions I wanted to ask you. Uh, <clears throat> I, was, oh, I haven't got time to ask them all now. This isn't fair. Uh, I'm, I'm completely flummoxed. I don't usually have a lack of questions. I've got about five different things I wanted to ask, such as what is the most challenging time you've had in your career? So let's go there. What's been, really quickly, what has been the most challenging time of your career to date? I'll start with Sarah. Mm, one paper rebuttal. We, we, really, we really had blood. We really rode with the blood. So it was very challenging. That's what, that's one, the first I remember that the, it was very, I mean, in the last, uh, in the last year. So it's, it's the first thing I remember when you are asking something like that. Yeah, no, that's a good answer, especially because every day is good. I thought sure <laughs> that would be quite a challenging question to ask. What about you, Andrea? Probably when I came to work once on Monday morning and I realized that something forgot the laser on... <laughs> the whole weekend in a normal <laughs> fat start that had uh, the, um, the fan uh, broken. That was a very, a very bad moment in my life. I don't mention who it was, but uh, 
I am sure that uh, he, he will laugh a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So on that note, I think we are up to the hour mark. Sarah, Andrea, do you know, it's been a privilege to talk to you today. It's a privilege to call you friends. And I think we're so lucky uh, to have got your time today. Because I, I, with the vaccination programme, with the research that you're going on and just how difficult it's been. And the fact that you, you both make it sound so much fun. I, I don't think I've, I really mean this. I don't think I've encountered a lab that just thinks it's lucky and happy and every day is the best. And the next day is the best day still to come. And that's not because the other days are bad. It's they're all good. It's just always getting better. I think that's tremendous credit actually to, to yourself, Andrea, for developing a team spirit in that sense. And like Cesaro, who embrace it and really move forward with it. And yeah, if you want, I was going to ask about inspirations. You all many, already mentioned Paul Robinson. Uh, he was one of the very early guests of Flow Stars because uh, he is an inspiration to any flow cytometry, any scientist, I would say, out there. But your impacts are tremendous and be proud of yourselves. Uh, thank you for joining us today. If you've enjoyed listening, please go and look at the other series, uh, recordings of Flow Stars. But Sarah and Andrea, thank you. Well, so we are not stars. Much. We are not stars. We are just people doing the job. I mean, I don't like the idea to be considered a star, even if we are. But <laughs> I mean, you have to be ironic. Be ironic. If I compare something to people, be ironic, have fun, play hard, work hard, play hard. And if you can, make jokes with your collaborators or with your boss. This is important. If, maybe you, if you survive, it's okay. But this is, <laughs> this is the message. <laughs> this has been a delight. It's been so much fun. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao, ciao, ciao.